Now, without further ado, I want to introduce our first keynote speaker of the day. We have Sterling Lujan. Sterling Lujan is a futurist, freedom activist, visionary, and public speaker. He is the former communications ambassador and, and opinion editor for Bitcoin.com. His background is steeped in activism, journalism, academia, and cryptocurrency technologies. He worked with Bitcoin.com from 2015 until 2019. Prior to his foray into cryptocurrency, he studied psychology and clinical counseling. He has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Texas A&M University. He's happily married to his beautiful wife, Cecilia. They live together in Texas. He is currently working on finishes his book called Collected Works Called Dignity and Decency, a Rhapsodic Musings of a Modern Anarchist. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Stern Lou. Richard, thanks a lot. How am I coming? Can everybody hear me okay? Sound okay. Are you guys awake today? How's it going? This is an amazing event. We've got to thank Richard for putting this on. I'm, I'm liking this already. So let me get my clicker here, and hopefully my slides will come up, and we can begin. Cryptococcal meningitis. Generally speaking, we wouldn't want to have a disease, but I was browsing the internet, and I saw this cryptococcal meningitis brain, and I thought, wow, this seems to imply a disease that we would want to have. It's the disease of crypto, the crypto bug that seems to have caught on and really infiltrated all of our being. The title of my presentation is called Cryptocurrency and the Psychological Evolution of Money. So money's an interesting topic. The nature of money is something that really fascinates me. And I think one of the reasons it fascinates me is because it inspires such a diverse array of emotions internally. There's a lot of people who have a tendency to adore money, to focus on it so much that it takes over their lives. And there are some people who absolutely loathe money. They think that it's the bane of society, that it causes some of the most issues in society. But what exactly is money? How does money work? So the interesting thing to me about money is that it's attached to this notion of value. And value is an interesting concept to me because it's not something that's physical. In this sense, money is not something that's physical. Sure, there are fiat dollars, there's gold and silver, there's a panoply of different kinds of money, but the value that is inherent in money is something that's totally subjective to the individual. The only reason that money has value is because we assign value to it. We give it that value. So one of my favorite thinkers in the cryptocurrency space, Andreas Antonopoulos, once said that value is a collective hallucination. Money is a collective hallucination, which is really interesting to me because it plays such a large part in our lives. There's, it's such a strong force. Now, for this presentation, we're going to talk more about that but I'm really interested in looking at how money affects us psychologically and how that psych psychological force that's affected our lives, how it's changing based on the reason that we're all here, based on cryptocurrency technologies that are coming to be part of our life. So I'm gonna discuss the physical evolution of money, the psychological evolution of money, and we're also going to look at some of the research studies in behavioral economics and how money has affected uh, so many people and the studies that we've used to see how money affects people. You know, one of the things I think about money having value, there are some people who believe that value is intrinsic to money or there's some kind of intrinsic property called value. Well, I submit today that it is true Money's value is totally and utterly subjective. There's no such thing as value that exists in a property. A lot of people will tell you that gold 
has value simply because it has industrial use cases or that it has some other type of use case in a market environment. Just because it has a use case or some type of utility doesn't mean that value is an intrinsic part of it. Value is always assigned to an object or to anything based on our human desires, based on what we believe about this money. So money, it's interesting how it started, how it evolved, how it physically came about. So in the earliest societies, we didn't have a concept called money. Most of us traded, and we're talking about the high Paleolithic, early tribal peoples before the invention of agriculture. Barter systems were effectively how we created trade and society, how we were able to work with each other to make sure value was properly exchanged. But of course, there are inherent limitations to the barter system. What happens when you want to trade a, or you want to acquire buffalo meat or a woolly mammoth meat, and all you have are some pickaxes or some stones, some large rocks? It's not easy to make those kind of exchanges. It, I mean, you would have to cut up the woolly mammoth into a million different little pieces to trade it for your pickaxe or for your large stone. So this is an inherent limitation to the barter system. So over time, money evolved out of this barter system. There wasn't some brilliant economist, some thinker who said, ah, I'm going to create money today. It was a natural evolution, an invention that cropped up because of our needs as human beings. So we had the barter system, and then after that we started using objects as money. We started applying this property of value to objects. So everything from cowrie shells to seeds to salt and pepper have been used as money throughout the ages. And then eventually we embraced the concept of metallic money and started minting silver and gold coins, and these have held value for roughly 3,000 years. 3,000 years, that seems to be the time point when money emerged and then people started to think about gold and silver. And just a little backstory in the Austrian school, who's familiar with the Austrian School of Economics? We have one, one hand. So, this is where money kind of comes from. It's called the regression theorem in Austrian economics. And this is this notion that a money first have to ha has to have a productive or consumptive element of it to become money. It has to have some kind of commodity use. So money has, and this is how it's evolved theoretically out of this barter system. You regress back to this early barter system and it necessitates money. This is this evolution. Now the interesting thing about money, or also the terrifying thing about money, is from the earliest ages it's always been controlled by governments or people in the upper echelon of society. So after gold and silver came to be popularized as money, uh, since right out of the gate kings and queens and politicians and bureaucrats and a lot of these people who don't necessarily have our goodwill in heart, decided to lord over the money supply, to control the money supply. And out of this monetary control, this fiduciary control, came the fiat dollar. And the fiat dollar, which is just the US dollar, uh, paper, banknotes, these became popularized and used by governments as a method for not only keeping the economy quote unquote healthy via them being able to control the money supply, but it also became a way for them to control us, to control people. And I think this has had wide ranging consequences, guys. This is one of the things that is a, a real tragedy to, to me in terms of where money came from and how it affects our lives.
So here's all the thing that's going on with fiat currency, and that's what I'm going to focus on because it is in most people's, the forefront of most people's consciousness in terms of the money in our society. So one of the things that's going on is that fiat currency first is generally etched with a king or a president's face or a politician's face. It has this deeply interwoven symbolism attached to it. And that symbolism is of authoritarianism. It's of control. It, it's a constant reminder that the money that is created has nothing to do with our sense of freedom, with the sense that we have control over our lives. The element of other people having control over our lives is deeply embedded in the monetary system, especially with fiat money. And what this has created is a master-slave dynamic. This notion that there are masters, there's a ruling class in society, and then there's a peasant or serf class. And this is not something that used to be. This is something that exists and persists right now, right in front of us. And it's a psychological detriment. It's a pain point in society. But luckily, the reason that we're all here today is because of a new money technology that's cropping up. This is the blockchain-based cryptocurrencies. And these blockchain-based cryptocurrencies are, what gonna, are already what's going to help alleviate some of the psychological stress that fiat dollars have put us under. So I wrote a, this article. It's been a good couple of years now. When I first started working for Bitcoin.com, I started studying behavioral economics and the psychology of money. And this article I wrote was on crypto psychology. And from studying the literature about how money affects us mentally and behaviorally, I, I came to notice that there's a lot of people, especially children and people growing up in our society who have no contact with money. I, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't get a money or a monetary education as I was growing up. I, I, in school, I was taught that the most important thing is to have rote memorization and to remember some type of arbitrary facts in high school. And my mother never really educated me or took the time to tell me about money, about saving money, keeping money, much less what it is, right? She didn't tell me that money is the way that we communicate value to each other. And to me, this is a type of language that's deeply part of the human psyche. And if we're not teaching each other about money, talking about money, and talking about how it works, we are missing something fundamental. So it should be a suggestion that the way that our monetary education is set up, especially in the United States, is absolutely broken. I learned nothing about money. It was only later on until after I swallowed a pill of MDMA and woke up. For anybody who's not familiar, that is ecstasy. It's a, it's a drug, the, no need to panic. <laughs> so I took MDMA, and at that point I started learning more about my life. I started learning more about existence, and of course I came into contact with cryptocurrency, and I started learning about money, and I thought, wow, this is definitely going to change the nature of the game. So there's this concept, and this relates directly to what I'm talking about, called a crematophobia. Crematophobia is the fear of money, and the fear of money is deeply embedded in, in, inside of us. But now that's changing. That's changing. Let's talk about, so you guys don't think that I'm just uh, spewing a lot of these ideas out as word vomit. Let's look at some of the studies in the context of fiat currency. So I said that I was never given a monetary education. I was never taught about the uses of money, about the importance of money. So there was this study done. It's actually a survey in 2015 called the Parents, Kids, and Money Survey. And what this survey showed was that three quarters of parents, three quarters of parents don't say anything to their children in the United States about money whatsoever. And think about this in the context of 
the, the system that we live under. Governments, their whole job, their modus operandi is to spend as much money as possible. Does anybody know the national debt of the United States? What is it, trillions of dollars? So this idea of just recklessly and arbitrarily spending money is at the heart of the fiduciary life in society currently. So that's a real shame that that's had to crop up in that way, and it's no wonder parents don't talk to their children about money. Another study, and this one is even more telling in the current context. So there's a researcher out of California, his name is Paul Piff, and he did this study called the Money Empathy Gap. And on this partic in this particular study, he really delved into the, how people interact with each other if one, of them's, if one person is advantaged and the other person is disadvantaged. And how he did this was in a little room, he set a monopoly board, and then he pitted the advantaged person and a disadvantaged person against one another in a game of Monopoly. Now the advantaged person had more dice rolls, they had more money to begin the game with, they didn't go to jail. Basically the game was so rigged in their favor that the other person didn't have a chance. And here's the interesting part of this study that's fascinating. As the players competed against each other, at first it was like a natural game. They were excited to be playing, they were laugh laughing, they were bantering, and they were friends. But as the game progressed, the person who was advantaged started to sneer begrudgingly down on the other person, on the disadvantaged player, started to make loud noises as they talked and spoke with the other person. They would grunt and they would gesticulate and they would flail their arms about wildly. The researchers even put a bowl of pretzels next to the Monopoly board and the person who was winning, the advantaged person, was hogging all of the pretzels, eating all of the, the food. And Paul Piff and his team came to the conclusion after they analyzed this study that somehow the advantaged player has lo lost touch with their ability to empathize with the other player. Now this is interesting to me because it suggests that money, and remember this is in the con context of monopoly, in the context of the current system, and the context of a fiat-based system, that it seems to be that money somehow saps our ability to relate to each other. And I'm not just saying this is has to do strictly with money. This game, obviously, there were some other things going on. The system, the context in which the game was based was rigged to begin with. It wasn't a fair game. The person didn't just have more money. They had more roles. They had more accessibility to the system. And this echoes what's going on in the current system. There are people, literally, on the upper echelons of society who can plug their own bank account into a computer, who can plug their own salary in without any kind of complaints. And always, people who have the first access to the system have the first access to a printing, a fresh printing of fiat dollars. And then when the trickle-down effect in this regard occurs, simultaneously hyperinflation occurs. So the last people to get a hold of the money also are the ones who have to pay the higher cost because the money has been devalued in that process harming everybody financially and psychologically. But now, thank goodness, the whole reason that we're here is because we are changing this power dynamic. We have created a cryptocurrency, a, de a decentralized digital currency that puts power back into the hands of the individual, that puts power back into our relationships and changes up the dynamic and invokes a beautiful shift of the paradigm, something that has been unprecedented in history. Now let's talk about a bit about cryptocurrency. I'm not going to delve into the technicals. That's not my task here. I just permit me to get a bit philosophical and discuss the properties that make this money so profound for our society. So this cryptocurrency, it has these features that 
make it so brilliant and so beautiful. One of those features is that it's decentralized. And what decent decentralization means is that there's no central point of failure. So these cryptocurrencies, and I'm generalizing here a little bit, there are differences from cryptocurrency to cryptocurrency, but generally speaking, uh, in the, we'll just use an example, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, there's no central point of failure in the sense that if you have money on your wallet, on your phone, who, by the way, who's, who is new in the cryptocurrency area? Brand new, anyone brand new? Okay, so a, a few hands. So it's gonna be much more difficult for people to steal your money. Obviously governments can't just siphon money out of a bank account. The money that you have that's cryptocurrency, you have on your wallet almost like it would be cash. It's not in a bank where bankers or bureaucrats have access to those funds. And, and does anybody remember what happened during the Cypriot financial collapse? In the Cypriot, when the, the, the Greek economy went under in Cyprus, uh, literally the government froze people's bank accounts and then stole their money so they could put it back into the economy. With cryptocurrency, that can't happen. There's no central point of failure. There's no bank for someone to come up to and just stop your, the transfer of your funds. Another element of this technology is that it's peer-to-peer. -peer. The idea behind peer-to-peer -peer technology in computer science is this notion that Alice can send money, can send funds to Bob directly without any type of intermediary looming over and holding some type of firearm between the two and enforcing an expropriation of some of that wealth. So the, the transfer literally happens from person to person, from person to person. Is so important. Another element of the technology is that it's borderless. And I don't mean borderless just in the sense of nation states, but also geographical borders all become a non-issue. We can send money from here in New Orleans. If we have cryptocurrency on our wallet, we can send it from here to Japan, a million dollars if we want to, with a very small fee without any type of ability to intercept that money. Think about what happens if you try to send a million dollars from here to Japan using Western Union or using the bank. What kind of pitfalls do you think you're going to run into? Think about if, you try to, if I tried to send money from here to Iraq or Afghanistan, a million dollars, what do you think they would think about me? that I was trying to finance some type of terrorist campaign. But I submit to you that it's nobody's business where I send my money. Not everybody who wants to send money anywhere is automatically a criminal. And thank goodness for cryptocurrency because this moves us outside the scope of having to worry about people take a bunch of our personalized information because we want to send money from one place to another. That is not the essence of freedom and privacy and dignity and decency. Another element of cryptocurrencies, and this is an element that get, can get kind of complex, and we'll, we'll talk about permissionless in a minute, I wanna talk about transparency. So when you make a transaction on a blockchain, depending on that cryptocurrency, those transactions are transparent, mean, meaning you can show where one transaction went to another person, went to another person, went to another person. You can trace these addresses as they move along the blockchain, as people make transactions. But here's the thing. So some people think that technology like Bitcoin is totally anonymous and private. That's not necessarily true. It's pseudonymous, meaning that if somebody uses, makes a transaction on a blockchain, but if they make that transaction and they push it through a centralized service like a <coughs> cryptocurrency exchange where they have to give up all their private information, well then they have them because you can then find every transaction that went to that wallet and trace everything back. But if you don't put your private personal info out there and you also keep your IP address concealed, then you can remain more private. But transparency is also important. If we're a public figure, if we're a leader in society and we wanna be able to transfer these funds to say a charitable organization or do something for the good of society, we want people to know where that money's going and people wanna know where that money's going. They don't wanna make sure we're ripping us off. You know, I've heard the stories about people not wanting to donate to charities anymore because they can't trust where charities are sending the, that money to, where it's going. And instances of theft 
have been limitless. So cryptocurrencies allow us to say, hey, here I am, I'm out in the open. We're going to send money to this charity. This is their address, and this is where all the money's going. You can look at it. Another element of this technology that's great and that totally beats out any of the old methods of monetary exchange is the fact that this technology is permissionless. And by permissionless, I mean the technology is open source. We can get involved in using cryptocurrencies and actively changing the code and changing the direction of these cryptocurrencies if, if the community agrees that it should be changed and the rules need to be changed. So that is always an option if any cryptocurrency project wants to take the direction or the trajectory of their technology elsewhere. And permissionless is a great component of the technology because it also allows others to audit the technology and to make sure that no one's getting cheated, scammed, or hurt in the process. So most cryptocurrencies, I'm not going to say all, I'm generalizing here a little bit, are non-proprietary. Okay, now this is the fun part. Let's talk about why cryptocurrencies, this beautiful money is so revolutionary. No, why it's so evolutionary, why it's taking us beyond the current financial system, why it's allowing us to evolve in terms of who we are as human beings and to almost become transcendent in the ways that we deal with each other. So not only is it better money as understood by its programmable nature, but it's also a money that allows us to work out more close-knit and tight relationships with each other because this money is built in integrity. It's built in honesty. And one reason it is is because no small group of guys can control the influx and the outflux of cryptocurrency and how much is created. So with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, there's a set number of units that will ever be created. It's 21 million units of cryptocurrency. And every time a new block is created, new cryptocurrency is issued, is, is put out. And it's, it's all set by the protocol. When it comes to fiat currencies, of course, governments can press a button, some politician can press a button and start printing out more money. Right? And we see this. Who's familiar with the situation in Venezuela? So, awesome. So in Venezuela, it's a, an ugly ecosystem for the people who live there because the government has hyperinflated the currency, which means they printed out so much of it that the only thing that it is good for is for kindling at the family's nightside fire. That's all. They make it purses, they make purses and wallets. <laughs> That's the other nice use case for the boulevard. Yeah. So it's utterly useless except for these alternative use cases and as fire for the family. But with cryptocurrency, this, this hyperinflation can never happen because not just a couple of people are in control of how much gets printed out. So they, they don't, they're not under the illusion that they can just arbitrarily manufacture as much wealth in society as they want to. So another thing about cryptocurrency is it changes our, our work patterns and our habits as well. The, the cool thing about crypto is because there's more of an equal opportunity for interaction with these systems and there's so many different cryptocurrencies that we can get involved in, it actually creates a whole new ecosystem for work that we can get involved with. So before I came into the cryptocurrency space and ever before I stepped on one of these stages and started speaking to you kind people, I worked for Walmart. I was embedded in the system and I was an assistant store manager. And I'm not saying this is bad. There are some people who love to do this, but I worked there for 10 years and I was making $40,000 a year to spend hours and hours and hours of my life at that place, just constantly working, toiling and struggling. And I, I really felt like I wasn't getting the value based on the work that I was putting in for that company because it was more about just the, the physical manual labor. It was about hours of my own soul that I dedicated to that company. Luckily, because of my background with drugs, I got fired from, 
from Walmart, thank goodness, because then I was able to find out about cryptocurrency again. And I've been in this space now. I've done crypto journalism, I've done writing, I've used blogging platforms that rely on cryptocurrency. So I've been able to make more than a living working inside the cryptocurrency ecosystem because it's more than just work. What this technology engenders is a new kind of work, a work that in involves our human creativity, our love for wanting to do something that matters with our life. And I think it goes beyond communism or capitalism. We're entering a whole new era or epoch of how we live and we interact. There's this brilliant writer, he's a, a marketer, his name's Seth Godin, he wrote a book called Lynchpin. And it, this idea is that now because of the way that technology exists, computers and the human mind become the means of production. And if we can become indispensable in terms of learning about how to leverage ourselves and turn ourselves into digital lifestyle businesses, et cetera, then there's no limit to what we can do as human beings. There's no limit to what we can achieve and acquire. And cryptocurrency is just one element that puts us in a situation where we, we can become linchpins, where we can become indispensable. And that's where I've focused my life now. Another thing that plays in with this about cryptocurrency is that it's heavily and highly gamified. The, game, the gamification of the current system, as we mentioned with the Monopoly game and the way that the system works is it's rigged. You, can't, you don't really feel fun playing within the context of the current system because it's broken, because the game is rigged and you're, it's not going to be in your favor no matter what. But with cryptocurrencies, you can play inside the cryptocurrency ecosystem, and we know because of the algorithms and the protocols have everything set up to meet our needs and our desires that we are now able, we are now able to enjoy being involved in this ecosystem. I'll tell you what, I used to play, before I got involved in, in, in this space and really woke up to try to do anything with my life, I played a lot of video games. I remember playing World of Warcraft quite regularly. And one of the, the reasons why I played this game was because I felt that I could actually make a difference in this digital world. I could acquire and hoard digital wealth, and I could feel good about that. Why do you think so many kids play video games? Because they don't feel like they can amount to something in the current reality that they exist in. So people get involved in these games because they can feel like they can actually win. Now I think with cryptocurrencies, as adults and as people who want to live lives, now we can win. It's gamified in such a way where we can achieve what we want to achieve and we can be who we want to be and we can do what we want to do. And it's an absolutely beautiful thing. I'm going to kind of finish up here. So I want to just mention this briefly. Not, I don't want to get too in depth because it's a long study. But one of the beautiful parts of these, this cryptocurrency revolution and having programmable money is that if we don't get along with each other or if we disagree with how it works, as I mentioned earlier, we can go a different direction. In, crypt in cryptocurrency technologies, this is called a fork. We can fork our crypto and go another direction. And I always ask people one question. If you try to fork the federal government, what, what happens to you? Bad things happen to you. You get thrown in a cage, you get shot you start a revolution, bad things happen. In crypto, if we disagree with the governance model of a particular cryptocurrency, we can either switch to another cryptocurrency and begin to use it, or we can fork it off and go a different direction. Just a small note on that. That's, that's the power of programmable money, and that's why it's so important. We, and if anybody wants to talk more about that, it's a long discussion, but after this presentation, by all means, approach me. So what we are entering into is almost an anomaly. We now are embracing a beautiful and brilliant paradigm shift. We are entering into a financial renaissance of unprecedented proportions. And anybody who thinks that they are going to underestimate this technology or that this technology is just a fad or it's not gonna do anything to change the very fabric and substrate of the life that we live are going to be gravely mistaken. They already are gravely mistaken because this technology has already changed people's lives for the better. Even regardless if the price goes up 
or if it goes down, it doesn't matter. People are going to use this technology no matter what, and they're going to use it to the best of their abilities. And this, my friends, is just the beginning of this radical evolution in currency and in programmable money and also in how we relate to each other. I think this is helping spur a paradigm where we're going to be closer to each other. We're going to have more empathy. There's going to be more connectedness and it's going to be absolutely amazing. And I, it's not only that I can feel it in the air, it's also that I've personally chose to live it. And I hope that all of you can choose to live it as well. Thank you. I, th I think I have some time for questions. Yes, yes if anyone has any questions that they want to pose, uh, please raise your hand and pass it by. Gentleman over here. Yeah, um, so I was just curious about your, your, your take on the court since you have a little time. Uh, what was your sort of your central thesis behind uh, that next slide? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. So the central thesis is that we can. It's about governance, right? The government, governmental model that we currently live under, and that is governments controlling society, politicians determining what the rules are and how that works. In cryptocurrency, that's totally, that's totally changed. So now if we don't agree with each other, if we have technological difference or even philosophical difference, we can fork a cryptocurrency. Let me give you an example. So recently Bitcoin, forked into Bitcoin Cash, and then Bitcoin Cash forked into Bitcoin SV or Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. So it, the, more re, the recent fork is more interesting to me. Satoshi Vision and Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin ABC forked off because it, the technical differences were mundane. There were some timeline, timeline differences that were trivial. It was really a difference in mindset and mentality. One group of individuals, and this is the, the Craig Wright camp, wanted to have more control over cryptocurrency. Plus they wanted to interact more with government and more with regulators. Whereas I, and this is just my opinion, where I believe the Bitcoin Cash community wanted to be more free, more open and create technologies that help people on a fundamental level. So th this is a good thing that we see. These forks can happen and people can go their own direction and they can do this without lifting up a gun and shooting each other, right? If you try to do this kind of fork, to a government, you get hurt in the process. So what I think is going to happen is eventually we're, we're going to create societies that are totally based on blockchain governance models within given geographical regions that allow us to interact with each other with a lot more cooperation and a lot more dignity and decency. Yeah. Yep, no problem. Yes, sir. Um, just listening to your academic background, some of the information that you were giving on psychology, one of my bachelor's degrees is in psychology as well, I'm currently working on a doctorate at LSU, and I'm looking to develop mentoring programs that has financial, financial components at the base, and I'm really working with the youth population. You were mentioning how as children, most of us aren't taught any type of financial education. So I'm really looking at not only financial education, but specifically coming from psychology background, financial behavior. So, because you can be as educated yep. as you want, but if you don't change your behaviors around money, then you're not gonna change much. So my question is, have you seen within your, within your, your work any type of activity in the crypto space that's been educating the younger population because I would love to incorporate that into what I look to do. You know, that's an interesting question. I, I tend to think that the cryptocurrency space in general is a, is a vast experiment in edu money education, monetary education, but I don't think I've seen, or not that I can recall, an organization that's based on just educating children about finances and about this new financial environment of cryptocurrency that we're moving into. So nothing that can comes to my mind right now. So I think that's a, a brilliant idea. That's something important and more of what we need. But I think some of this also hinges around just the whole public education system needs completely redone, revamped. That actually probably just needs to go away and we just need to put uh, voluntary institutions and individuals and parents in control of children's education because I'm going to go off on a soapbox here, but the education system was based on the Prussian model of education, which is basically its goal is to create obedient worker drones 
who could just go and be a cog in the machine. So we're, but we're creating this new environment where creativity and the, and the goal of being a linchpin is starting to crop up and people want to be their, their own selves. They want to have a soul being an essence and they want to live to the best of their ability. And that's, I think, where we're going to start moving. So your, that idea is, is brilliant. We need more of that as we start to grow and change. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? How you doing? Um, yes, sir. Quick question. How do you feel about institutional money coming into the space? Do you think it's going to make it uh, less, uh, more centralized? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I, I just think that's going to happen naturally. You know, when, when you get into a technological situation where the old paradigm bumps up to the new paradigm, naturally there's going to be overlap. Old money is going to come into the system, help prop up the system. And this is all going to occur on the road to mass adoption before people take on cryptocurrencies. You know, Andreas Antonopoulos gave this awesome example one time of... Showing, demonstrating this is what happens because look what happened when the automobile came into existence. The roads, the infrastructure that was created was not purposed for automobiles so the cars would get stuck on the cobblestone streets and you know the cars were rudimentary at the time. So it took a long time to build out the infrastructure built for automobiles for them to take over. So I think just naturally more institutional money is going to flow into the space to help build some of these projects up until there is no previous and prior institution. And I'm not to answer your question even more directly, I'm not opposed to that. I just think that's going to happen, and I think we should probably just go ahead and embrace it. I, because where we're going, I think, is naturally uh, toward the future into a cryptocurrency ecosystem or environment. So I hope that helps out. Yes, sir. So is, uh, is hyperinflation uh, inevitable in the monetary system we got? Yes, absolutely. Now, there are some governments who are a bit more restrained in terms of the amount of money that they print out, but this is, uh, this is a thing, a theme we've seen over and over and over again with uh, government-controlled, uh, state-based monopolies on capitalism. So these individuals, because they're able to control the money supply, they eventually will start to lack restraint and print out more. You, you know, and you see this especially in a lot of governments in different places in the world where they've printed out so much money that hyper, so hyperinflation is a huge part in a bunch of places in Africa. South America is really bad. And the, it's only a matter of time before the larger economies also lose the purchasing power of their dollars. And we saw that with the economic collapse uh, based on the housing bubble here recently in the United States and then in Cyprus. Had, yeah. So this is something that will always continue to happen so long as just a few group of individuals are allowed to control the, the money supply. The money supply really for this not to happen has to be disinflationary, meaning that the protocol or system that's put in place re rejects arbitrary inflation of the currency and there's a set amount based on the context of that system and the context of the environment that we live in. That helps. All right, everyone, please give a round of applause for Sterling Thank you. Thank you.